Welcome to TraumaCast. It's like a podcast, but about trauma. Listen and learn from our team about current trends, new research, and continuing performance improvement efforts. This education is available for CNEs. Successful completion includes watching or listening to the entire session and completion of the attestation and evaluation. The link for the attestation and evaluation is located at the end of this video. We hope you enjoy and please let us know what you think. Hi everyone, welcome to the first trauma cast of 2024. Um, and it's my first trauma cast ever. So for those who don't know me, my name is Joanna Kim. I am now the new Injury Prevention Education and Outreach Coordinator uh, for the Trauma Department. I took over for Sydney Coulson. Um, and I'm here today with Jen Fritzine and Liz Weibel, those two people in our um, in our office that you guys are very familiar with on the Trauma Cast. And today we're going to talk about blood products and massive blood transfusion in the code room. Recently, we've had some changes in broad products, and we wanted to make sure we had all the recent information um, out for you guys. Um, so here we go. Um, so a few years ago, we introduced the uh, blood refrigerator in the code room, which has allowed us to give blood products quickly to our trauma patients, especially those with um, hemorrhagic injuries, um, penetrating injuries. Um, and Jen, since going live with a blood fridge, how quickly are we able to transfuse patients since they arrive? Now that we have that blood refrigerator and we have blood products readily available, we are now able to get blood started usually within five minutes of patients arriving to the emergency department um, when clinical indications uh, give us the need for blood products. I just um, want to point out that four years ago, our time was about 10 minutes. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. Massive, yeah, positive changes, last month proven. Yeah. And um and why is it important having to have blood immediately available for these uh, patients? Okay, my claim for fame statement. You do not <laughs> yes. bleed normal saline. It's my favorite statement. <laughs> <laughs> so when a patient is coming in, they've had a traumatic injury, whether it's blunt or penetrating, we can almost always assume they're bleeding from somewhere. So the best thing to treat bleeding Stop the bleeding mm -hmm. and then give blood products, whether it's packed red cells or plasma. Right. And um, Liz, what is an important product or a superior treatment in uh, giving these blood products super quickly? What's one of the most important things? Um, well, that you're restoring their intravascular, um, their intravascular volume, and you're essentially preventing shock, and you're actu actually um, increasing their odds of living. The bleeding trauma patient, every minute that goes by um, where they're not receiving um, the, the blood that they're losing, actually can really contribute to their their mortality. So it's incredibly important. Well, yeah, I and what do we, we can, have? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, we can look at it from that trauma try to death. Mm -hmm. where Three things are happening when you're bleeding, when you're in hemorrhagic shock, you're cold, we know how to warm you up, you're coagulopathic, well, that will give you, your plasma will help that, and your acidosis and volume is going to help that. And then to add in a fourth phase is we need to get oxygen going to your tissues, and that's your red blood cells. Right. And what do we have in our fridge? Um, is our fridge stocked the same way as, let's say, CICU's blood refrigerator that they have? No. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. It's very different, actually. CICU, I believe, just has O negative blood, red cells, mm -hmm. where our refrigerator has two units of O negative, mm -hmm. two units of O positive and two units of plasma. And can you tell us why we have the different uh, O positive and O negative available? So uh, let me give you a little history to it. In, a couple years ago, we had three gunshot injuries come in within like a six hour period. And they were all male. And the hospital almost ran out of O negative blood. Oh, wow. So we really started talking about and looking at the literature about using O positive blood for males. Um, there's in a boy patient, you don't worry about RH zero conversion. So they can definitely get an RH positive blood. 
where a female someday may have a baby and we might have to worry about that RH serum conversion. And so we have O negative for them. Okay. And what if we have um, a male patient uh, that needs transfusion and we use the two units of the, um, of the positive, O positive blood? Can we use the O negative for them? If you don't have anything else, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And same vice versa. Um, we're going to start with O negative blood on female patients. But if we haven't gotten any more blood from the blood bank yet, and your patient's bleeding out in front of you, and that's all you have is that O positive, the physicians in the room can look at the risk benefit and make the decision to go ahead and give the O positive. But I think this also points to, you know, a good practice tip where, yeah, you know, a bleeding trauma patient's coming in or has just arrived. You know that you have products in that fridge, but they're limited. So best practice would be to activate massive transfusion as quickly as possible um, to get additional products there. Well, and right. Joanna, do you want to talk about grab and go? Yes, I was just going to talk. <laughs> That's good. It was great <laughs> that you guys are leading right into it. Liz has that in nicely. So yes. yes, we have all those products in the refrigerator downstairs. But mm -hmm. what people don't realize and this is for the ER as well as the inpatient units, is that the blood bank has a cooler pretty much always ready to go that has three units of O negative blood and two units of plasma. That basically all you need is a sticker and they will give it to you. Now you'll have paperwork to do on the back end, but you won't have to delay getting that. So we should get grab and go within minutes. Perfect. And do we have to have a massive blood transfusion order in for the grab and go to uh, be released? No, you can take a sticker and they'll give it to you. Now, they're going to want you to put up the order, but they won't delay giving you the product. Okay. At least Perfect. that's what they tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and so I guess segueing into the massive blood transfusion port protocol, if we know that a trauma patient is coming in and we know that he has a, he or she has a penetrating injury. Can we activate that before the patient has arrived? Absolutely. Absolutely. If as long as you have an account number, you can activate. Okay. Perfect. Would it be reasonable, Jen, to call the blood bank even before? Like, let's say you get the call, you're waiting for that acute, you know, the acute registration that's in progress. It's probably fine to just call the blood bank and give them a heads up, right? Oh, absolutely. The more heads up we can give the blood bank, the more they can start to prepare. Because we have to remember that the rest of the hospital is needing blood too. And so they're trying to take care of other patients. So if we can give them a heads up, it'll help them out quite a bit. And then as as we are preparing for the penetrating um, trauma patient, um, since we have that lovely new poster in in the room with all that information, can we go ahead and start setting up the blood from the blood refrigerator and putting that into the Belmont so that it's already like primed and ready to go? Yeah, I would highly suggest it. Um, people are still getting used to using the Belmont and that way you can do it in a little bit with less stress and make sure you can get it to work. Um, the Belmont's going to be important because it'll help us deliver warm product. Again, back to that trauma try to death. Um, we want the volume and we want it warm. Don't be afraid to spike that bag if you think you potentially could need it and that way you're ready to go. And what about the plasma? Do you, um, I already know the answer, but <laughs> do you think we should be giving the patients the PRBCs with the plasma? Not a bad idea. I always ask and I'll say, they'll say, let's get blood. And I'll ask, do you want plasma to go concurrently? Um, it doesn't have to be linear. The Belmont has three spikes, so you can get red and yellow at the same time. And that goes back to my hot dog analogy, um, which I think <laughs> this about is my favorite. This is have yeah. heard. <laughs> okay, if you haven't heard the hot dog analogy, if you like ketchup and mustard on your hot dog, you want to be able to taste the ketchup and the mustard at the same time. Otherwise, forget it. Same thing with blood. If you're bleeding, you want to have red cells and yellow cells going in an equal amount 
So your blood is oxygenating and clotting in equal amounts so one's not overpowering the other. So ketchup and mustard. Ketchup it's and okay mustard. okay to give them at the same time. Don't freak out if <laughs> a little bit of red cells go into your plasma. They're still going to the patient. <laughs> Awesome. Now makes me want some hot dogs for uh, for Super Bowl. <laughs> and um, whenever we take uh, the blood products out of the refrigerator, what are some of the, um, what's the paperwork that needs to be done? It, it's right there on the refrigerator. So there's a paper on the refrigerator that you put a sticker on and just follow directions. I can't remember exactly what they asked. And then you need to make sure that it's ordered in the system. And then each bag of plot product has a paper order sheet that needs to be signed and returned to the blood bank. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so we have the blood uh, blood from the fridge that we removed and we primed the Belmont with the PRVCs and plasma. We have the grab and glow in the room. Um, when can we start giving platelets and cryo? Good question. So with your massive blood transfusion, platelets come in pack B and cryo comes in in back C. And it's part of the yellow, the yellow products. So we have that yellow to equal the red. So plasma would be in pack B when the second cooler comes down. Cryo would be Paxi when the third cooler comes around. And I'm counting the first cooler as grab and go, if that makes sense. So right. if it's a young baby, you might not need the grab and go. Mm. Okay. Um, and remember with platelets and cryo, not through the bell net. Mm -hmm. There's another port closer to the patient on the bell net too that you could just push. Perfect. Um, yes. And what is, uh, the paperwork that you, because the massive blood, blood transfusion, because we don't use it that much in practice in the, on the floor, on, in the ER. Um, and I mean, we do initiate a lot in the, in the code room. What did you make so that we can keep track of all the units that we, um, we have given them? So one of the complaints we got from both the OR and the ICU was the ER would bring a patient up with massive blood trans transfusion and we just kind of dumped the patient off and nobody would have a clue where we were at with the one-to-one -one red to yellow combo. So we just put together a paper form, hangs on a clipboard. And if you're delivering products through the Belmont, just circle, get a unit of red unit yellow or plasma, use a platelet. And that way you can just hand it to the OR or the ICU and everybody's on the same page. Perfect. And it's just so easy to use without having <laughs> to like shift through all the uh, trauma paperwork and addendums that we have that is just yeah. um, an easy, uh, Visually, it is, I think, visually easy. <laughs> it, it is. Once you see it's there, it's hanging on the clipboard. But the problem mm -hmm. is, is remembering to use it. I mm -hmm. have been guilty of forgetting to use it. And so I understand when you're not doing it often, you're a little stressed. You're mm -hmm. just happy as heck. The Belmont's working. <laughs> and you've been able to set it up. You may forget that. But it's hanging there. And it really will help the patient as we transition their care. Yes. The anesthesiologists sure. love it. Oh, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have prepared for a 13-year-old patient with a GSW uh, with um, massive blood transfusion has initiated. He came into the code room. We have everything ready into the Belmont. Um, what are some um, issues we had with Belmont working properly? Like a lot of like user errors that we have noticed that um, that have kind of delayed the use of actually giving the patient the blood through the Belmont. 
Well, I think one of the first, um, but the first things that we that we encountered was that the Belmont needs to be plugged in to work to rapidly transfuse. You have to have it plugged in. It will still work, but at a much mm. lower rate if it is unplugged. So I think that's number one. Make sure it's plugged in. <laughs> that would be my number one tip. <laughs> yeah, oh, um, and also remember that if it's not plugged in, like Liz said, it goes slow. It goes at 50 mils per minute. People get very confused and think that's per hour. You can hardly push at 50 mils per minute. So it's still going at a good speed. Um, the blue clay or giving hooking it up to a T-connector mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. also really slow you down. I want to say the blue clay will give you an air message yeah. Yeah. on the Belmont. Yeah. Um, Trying to think what else. You, sometimes you just got to slow down and make sure all your tubing has been pushed mm -hmm. in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to load any of the tubing after you turn it on, you won't yeah. be able to do it. So load it before you turn it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not a, it's not a, like we're so used to priming all of our tubing before placing it into a machine, like into our syringe mm -hmm. pumps, into our Alaris pumps, um, it's a little not intuitive that we just put a dry tubing into the machine. But the Belmont is amazing and <laughs> it will take care of itself. <laughs> but it will, it just needs to be done in a way that he likes to be done. <laughs> the Belmont has its ways of being taken care of and you gotta yes. pay attention to it. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so going back to this acute patient um, who's needs who needs blood, what um, is the, so there has to be uh, there's been a little bit of changes in the lab work, right? Um, with the typing crosses, is it true that we need two type and cross samples um, for for each patient? If they're an acute patient who's never been here before, which all acute patients are, have to be looked at as new. You need to get two type and cross, and they can be getting given or gotten a minute apart. Um, and so, part of the orders the NAL put in with complete, um, or actually, it's part of the acid blood transfusion order set, is to get two type and cross. Um, that form that we talked about for keeping track of the mass of blood transfusion, what you've given, also has a lines on there that you can put a check mark. I did one type and cross, I did two, and that'll help people remember to do handoff with that if you've only gotten one. Okay, so what will happen if we only draw one and send that and don't do the second one? Usually nothing terrible, they'll still give you blood. Um, it's a way for blood bank to, it's, it's a safety measure to make sure that they've been typed and crossed and it's been double checked. And so if we don't get a second one, they'll call the nurse taking care of the patient at the next level of care and ask. Um, we also keep track here in the trauma office. So Liz or I may make a phone call and say, hey, you need a second type and cross still. We've been trying to play nice with the blood bank and not making them do all the work. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Open communication. <laughs> Great. So we are, this patient is ready to go to the OR. We have his Belmont is running. We have his um, two type and cross ready and sent to the labs. Um, what, um, what should we bring with us in regards to the massive blood transfusion um, protocol um, that needs to travel with that patient? I mean, I, I would imagine just any additional products that are in the cooler, right? Mm -hmm. I would definitely send, you know, whatever you have blood product wise so they can go ahead and get that started. Even if he's in the OR, you know, you'll still um, want to use what's left in the cooler. Um, and I would, I would make, have to make the NAL or somebody should be calling the blood bank to let them know the patient's move location. Perfect. Jen's handy Great. sheet. Take yes. The sheet. 
Yes. <laughs> the sheets. Yeah, don't it's forget so the sheets. critical to the operating team, including anesthesiology, how much, how much product the patients received and, and what amounts. Awesome. Um, and so now that we're wrapping like up the code room with a patient in the OR, um, and now we've used all the products that that was in the fridge. Um, how does that get? How does the fridge get restocked? How do we get more so that we're ready for the next uh, trauma patient? Let me go restock, um, and they try to do it as quickly as they can. They yeah. obviously know we've used slugs from the refrigerator because we've called them. Um, there is no set time frame on when they have to have it restocked. Because remember, again, blood bank is still trying to take care of other patients too. And a refrigerator can't take that place. So <laughs> they'll do it as quickly as they can. If something else comes in and you need blood, call blood bank because they're also replenishing that grab and go. And we can get it from them really quickly. Mm. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, about six months ago, we had two teenage boys come in within 10 minutes of each other, and we knew they were both going to need a lot of blood. Mm -hmm. So the one had already started to deplete the refrigerator. So before the second one got here, we just went and got the grab and go. And mm -hmm. that way we could get them both started. Mm -hmm. And there was no delay on either side. Awesome. Yeah, it's um, it's so hard to remember that the rest of the hospital yeah. is still in full function and an operation and they yeah. still need everybody's help. Yeah, those HEMON kids, yeah, mm -hmm. your HEMON kids, your CV yes, surgery you. patients, yes. the ICU, those kids all need blood too. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. So please be patient with them. They are working as hard as they can to restock <laughs> our fridge. Um, great. So we're going to just shift a little bit um, to pre-hospital um, uh, work that's being done. So Maryland, we know that Maryland State Police is carrying whole blood in their helicopters. And I think there's um, some talks about D.C. Fire and EMS also having um, blood in their ambulances. Um, what is the um, benefit of whole blood um, well, the, rather than the, what we have? The ketchup and mustard is already in equal portions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and you don't have to worry about hanging plasma, hanging blood. It all goes in good other. So why not? Why don't we all have like whole blood? <laughs> why? Why? Uh, what is a negative? <laughs> so there's not a ton of negative. I think one negative is platelets don't last very long in whole blood. Mm -hmm. So usually like within three to five days, the platelets function has minimized to almost mm -hmm. nothing. But OK, we can still live with that. Um, there's definitely some stocking issues that are I don't totally understand but it's a blood bank problem um but to be honest with you there's a lot of good studies on whole blood it's being used in pediatrics pretty safely mm -hmm. and I'm going to jump ahead to your probably next question <laughs> 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 we are getting whole blood <laughs> um we are going to be part of a multi-center trial probably starting this fall in which whole blood will be introduced uh, to some of our patients. And I believe it'll be randomized um, to who gets it versus who gets component therapy. And so we've decided that that was the best way to bring it into Children's National versus deciding to just do a protocol on our own. Yeah, absolutely. But I think it also speaks to the, the, just the advances over the last several years. I mean, just four years ago, the blood fridge had, you know, just one type of blood, just, you know, yeah. just O negative and then plasma the next year and now mm -hmm. O positive and O negative. So um, that's definitely going to be um, exciting moving forward. You know, it's funny. People talk about massive blood transfusion yeah. as a process improvement. I talk about it as our blood story. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's been quite the story. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We we just keep writing more chapters. Yes. Um, oh, I like that. Writing more chapters. <laughs> you know, and 
I feel like I also have to get a shout out to the blood bank. They are probably one of the best departments to partner with mm-hmm. in order to make changes, to keep up with the literature, and just really look at how processes work and be successful. It, so any problems you have with massive blood transfusion, please let us know. Um, Liz, Joanna, myself, mm-hmm. Dr. Delaney and her team in the blood bank, everybody is open. That's great. And it's such a lovely partnership. We've gotten so many changes um, in the last couple of years uh, to really benefit the code room and the patients that come through. Um, just a little uh, additional question with the um, with the pre-hospital or partners, pre-hospital partners carrying whole blood. If a patient is getting an infusion of the whole blood, what do we do with that? Do so we the let them finish that? So the instruction from, yes, the instruction from Maryland State Police is go ahead, let them finish the bag. Mm-hmm. Take the bag, that bag of blood to the blood bank. Um, and furthermore, there had been advice to, um, also take the type and screen that was drawn en route to the hospital up to the blood bank. So I I would probably do that whether or not they'll accept it, not sure, but that was, those were the basic steps outlined by, by Maryland, um, by MIMS, uh, the governing body of Maryland State Police. Again, um, finish the transfusion, um, take that blood bank and any samples that were drawn ahead of time. Um, upstairs uh, to the blood bank. Perfect. Thank you. And, and there should be a special, oh, sorry, there should be a special um, um, wristband on the patient as well with a mm-hmm. QR code and that QR code one can scan and then get further information about um, blood administ- whole blood administration um, in the pre-hospital setting. Perfect. And that'll be like a like an ID band that's placed on the patient? Yeah, correct. Correct. With the, with the QR code. Awesome. Um, and to, I guess, for those at the bedside, if they do have any problems with the blood product acquisitions, getting a grab and go, um, uh, cooler or getting the fridge restocked, what, um, who can the, who can the bedside nurse contact or the NAL? Uh, Don't give them too hard a time about restocking that fridge. (laughs) They're doing the best they can. They really are. Um, if you do have problems or perception of problems, like I said, let Liz, myself, or Joanna know. Um, you can reach out Dr. Sharon in the ICU, is chairs the blood utilization committee. So you can, he'll lend his ear. Dr. Delaney, Dr. Mo, um, uh, Cyril, and I can't think of his last name, Shaquat, Dr. Shaquat, um, in the blood bank. All of us are open to any feedback that you have or improvements we can make. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Um, and to end the trauma cast, um, do you guys have one pearl, one takeaway pearl that you would like to share um, with the uh, with the with the nurses or those who are listening to the trauma cast regarding blood products in the code room or um, massive blood transfusion? Um, starting with Liz. Okay. Um, well, I can't get enough of the hot dog analogy. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> they need the volume of the red cells. A bleeding patient also needs the plasma as well, those clouding factors. So just run up, hang them at the same time, run them at the same time. Um, they definitely work tremendously well simultaneously. So don't forget the ketchup and the mustard. And yes. warm it all up. And warm it up. Yep. Yes. Yeah. No one wants a cold hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Awesome. Any other pearls or anything (laughs) else, Jen, that you want to add? We've tried to make a lot of job aids. We have the the 5656 phone number on the penetrating injury poster. If you don't have the trauma app, download CN Trauma. There's a lot of blood references in the blood and lab file. Um, We have the paper that's hanging on the Belmont to communicate. Um, so just trying to make your life as easy as we can when things are really stressful. Mm-hmm. Yes. And mine is nobody bleeds sailing. So please don't remember, <laughs> don't forget to, that we do can start with blood. <laughs> 
Yes. Right. And, you know, and also to that point, I mean, if you have saline going in, you're going to delay the start of your blood products. And so mm-hmm. you want to get in, you know, warm blood as quickly as possible. Yes. Avoid the triad of death, the trauma triad of death. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, This was very insightful and thank you for making it as painless as possible for me (laughs) for my first trauma cast. Um, And if you guys have any questions, please let us know. We have the evaluation for you guys to finish and to receive your hours. Thank you. And uh, we are going to sign off for now.